Hi, friend. Thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here, Tashin. So maybe we could start by asking the question everyone's asking, which is how the heck do you pronounce your name? <laughs> yeah, people are avoiding saying it whenever they can, and I'm going to give them no more excuse now. Yes. My name is pronounced Ta'alumot. Ta'alumot. Yes, the emphasis is on the last syllable. And the key thing that I think people have trouble with is that those two A's next to each other, there's like an apostrophe in between. Ta'alumot. Uh, tricky, tricky. Okay, great. Ta'alumot. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Yeah, but I, but you can call me tiger guy or, you know, the, I mean, the word means secrets. Some of our friends call me secrets, you know, in English on Twitter, I mean, uh, and, you know, if you say tiger, tiger dad, um, I know who you're talking to. Okay. Tiger dad or <laughs> secrets or Ta'a Lumot. Yeah. Perfect. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about why you picked that name? Absolutely. Well, uh, as I said, it means secrets mm -hmm. and, uh, it's it's a secret what my name is that's why i picked it there's a lot more to that name uh that i've that i've only at the very very beginning of being this person did i did i really dig into the etymology of the name it has a very cosmic meaning it doesn't just mean secrets in the conventional social sense it it, it means like the secrets of the universe uh but you know obviously it also means it's a secret who i am uh-huh uh -huh. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, as you may or may not know, uh, at the beginning of my episodes, I typically like to ask the guest who they are and what their story is. You're anonymous, so you may not want to share everything about this, but whatever you would like to share about your background and story, we would love to hear. Absolutely. Well, it will, it will be a short story. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there are still details about who I am in a biographical sense that I'm comfortable sharing because mm -hmm. they're not identifying. Uh, I, I am a new being who has only existed for one month, but has uh -huh. a whole, a whole life of memories. And I, the one thing I can say for sure is that I used to be someone else, someone mm -hmm. who wasn't a secret and uh, that person had to go. Uh, and so the, the, but, 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 you know, whatever sort of conference of beings, uh, I actually am, uh, missed being out online talking to all of the wonderful people we talked to. So they sent a delegate back into the world, uh, under, in a disguise. And, uh, that's, that's who I am. And I've been on Twitter for a month. And that's really the only place until right now that I have been. Uh, and that's uh, been really amazing. It's been, it's been very liberating to be there and just be this kind of character uh, that doesn't have an identity that exists in any kind of three-dimensional way. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I do talk a lot about my own experience and my experience is colored by various, as I said, sort of memories that came pre-installed in my consciousness uh, of a lifetime of Zen training and practice. And, uh, I'm, and, and, and also uh, uh, many lifetimes of, of Jewish cultural and religious uh, and familial training. And those two sort of twin, uh, let's call it a double helix of uh, wisdom and uh and and formative teachings and experiences and practices uh inform informs who i am and and, and how, I, how i show up i also uh, am married and have two children and uh these uh they know who i am i assure you i'm not a mystery or secret to them uh there you haven't been, been around for only a month to your no, family no, no. apparently uh, apparently i've been around for at least a few years uh in order to uh, create these children um, uh, in some sense, somewhere. And, uh, and, and they, are, they form a very critical piece of sort of my present day experience and perspective and the kinds of things I like to share and talk about. Uh, though, of course, their identities are also secrets. They're part secrets. of this secret. Uh, and, and maybe what, what else? Uh, I, I'm a musician, I'm a writer, I have 
uh, waning, let's call it a waning interest in technology. Uh, I, I have read a lot of weird books. I have a history of uh, a long period of, of psychedelic exploration that I've talked a fair amount about and, and, and the way that that integrates with these with this double helix of, of tradition. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't go all the way and call that a third uh, a triple helix, but it was, it was a component of both of these ways of, of experiencing the world. And uh, I, I just love, I, I mean, really, if I'm having a good day, I'm just talking about like yummy food and st normal stuff that's happening. Um, and this, you know, vicissitudes of life in COVID in America in 2021. Uh, but all of that infused with just the sort of real amazement at, that the universe is anything like this, uh, that I think we all share uh, in this community of people that has brought you and me together. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, it's nice to learn a little bit about you and where you come from. That's a fascinating mix of influences, uh, especially for a being that's only been around for a month. Um, <laughs> a lot to take in. A lot to take in. Yes. <laughs> Big download. Um, so I thought maybe we could do kind of a greatest hits of some of the tweets that you've had during the month that you've been around. And I could just ask you more about some of them. And then, of course, we can open it up towards the end, towards anything else that we might like to talk about. How does that sound? Wonderful. Great. So I think uh, the first one I'd like to get at is um, one that's been mentioned on the podcast previously, I believe by Mark, which is a terrific tweet that's been, you know, banging around my own head since you tweeted it just a few weeks ago. But um, you said, I just blew my own mind replying to someone when I realized that people think Dharma arguments are about ontology when they're actually about pedagogy. Uh, yeah, what what led to that realization? And can you say more about it? Well, it's a very Zen attitude. And so I can't help myself. But it's not really unique to Zen to say that, you know, the finger pointing at the moon thing, to say that the Dharma in a formal sense is not the truth. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a description brought back after a non-conceptual experience. And the truth is incomprehensible or you know, is, is, is not subject to language and articulation. And that is the, I guess, the mystical sense of what I mean. But the thing that was so profound that day that pointed me to, well, it, and that's not a complete thought, the, 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 that's, that's the ontology part. That's what the why it's not ontology part. The why, the what is it then? The Dharma is a way of teaching people to discover this for themselves. And so it's a means to an end, skillful means would be sort of the Buddhist terminology for what it is. It's, it's a thing that, uh, you have to do in order to help other beings access this understanding. And when that understanding is apprehended directly, all of that formal, contingent, conventional stuff falls away, is no longer necessary. So in short, it's pedagogical. It's there to get students to the other end of the road. And that's essentially what what formal Dharma is for. And so, you know, you can make a lot of other claims about it, but I really, it's sort of my belief, and I mean this in like an intellectual sense, that uh, that's, that's a, a, a fundamental Buddhist attitude uh, about what the Dharma really is. And that like many, many, many instances of the actual Buddha's, you know, recorded words say exactly this. Um, so, but, but what was happening to me that day when I realized it, when I was in this conversation with someone, I don't, unfortunately don't remember exactly what the conversation was, although I might be able to find it using that tweet, but the, you know, it was just one of those things that happens on Twitter all the time where you get into to it with someone about some concept. And 
you know, we're always going around and around and around talking about these non-conceptual experiences in highly conceptual ways and often complaining that this is that this talk is wasted at best and like actively harmful at, at worst. And, you know, because it creates ideas and preconceptions and goals and, you know, ambitions and competition and, uh, you know, uh, posturing and all, all of these, it, it's, that's essentially what a person on social media is made of. It's just like a collection of attitudes, uh, and, you know, statements and the, um, the, 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 the community that we're in is they're making statements about things that can't be made into statements. And there's a, there's a maddening quality to that. And it is sometimes maddening to me, even though I engage in it, although most of the time, I would say 90% of the time I have the self-control not to engage in conversations about, let's just be concrete conversations about what enlightenment is or what, you know, what the, what the goal of meditation practice is, or which forms of meditation practice are closer to the real deal. And, you know, like there's, there's, there's so much stuff that I just don't want to talk about but I find myself doing it anyway, sometimes. And, and what I realized that day was that the reason I am invested in those conversations and the reason that I'm invested in any particular lineage and practice form myself is that I see it as effective on this particular social level. Not, it's not, it's not that I believe in any intrinsic, like metaphysical importance of the particular attitudes about Buddhism or spirituality that I have. It's, it's that they worked on me and that there are people who are more or less like me that might be helped by these methods. And what I'm doing out there by being a particular way is putting out like a lighthouse beacon for people who are feeling it and want to come closer because we can support each other by being the way we are together. That's what Sangha is. And so I'm not making universalizable statements that are true for everyone. I'm making statements about a particular view and I'm not making them because that view is correct to me. I'm making them because it's effective. It's functional in conveying the real truth that you know is for each person to discover to a to people with particular i don't know karma inclinations histories tendencies bodies minds etc and what i wanted to say that day was that if you get that and you approach dharma dialogue from that stance it becomes possible to have it with people with radically different beliefs and practices and approaches and teachings and training, because what you're doing then is you're comparing notes pedagogically and understanding who the teaching that they are speaking from is for and who yours is for and understanding that they're not necessarily for the same people, because it, what you're saying is not something that describes reality in an ultimate way. What you're saying is something that will reach certain people in certain ways. And you can learn about other people through that kind of conversation. So as long as you don't get lost in the idea that anything that you're saying is fundamentally the truth uh, that you have some unique claim over, this is kind of the bridge to pluralism that I really hope that uh, we can build out there in this extremely heterodox fascinating diverse community of practitioners and teachers and yeah. whatever we are which is like I, let's just call each other you know dharma siblings like you know i don't i don't uh, practitioners and teachers like yes there are practitioners yes there are people who identify as teachers i don't identify as a teacher you know but so what is it what does it mean to go out there and like preach the dharma if you're not a teacher like i'm not that's what i'm saying is it's not preaching it's sharing mm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, that uh, desire for a bridge between traditions and practices is definitely uh, very dear to my heart. And I would say as well to this 
show, whatever it is. I don't, I don't know what this show is, but I have these conversations with people on that seems to be a recurring theme is bridging the different traditions and practices that people are doing and just seeking the wisdom that's in each of these backgrounds and histories and uh, practice themes and so on. So really appreciate that. Um, yeah, that makes me curious. I, I, I can see how that might be connected to this, but I wanted to ask about um, the, the, the next tweet, which is, it's time for glorious rainbow supa of Buddhist memes 2.0. And then you have this enormous thread of Buddhist memes and other people have submitted them. I myself have submitted some. Uh, tell me about the need for a stupa and what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, well, 2.0 is a reference to the fact that, that in, a previous, in a previous universe, in a previous kalpa, the, this stupa stood ah and uh i don't think i ever saw that stupa hundreds of billions of buddhas and ancestors paid homage to it uh -huh. uh, and so that so that in this universe uh it was inevitable that it would come to be again uh and here's what here's why i here's why i scroll so far three times a day to the bottom of that stupa in order to keep adding memes to it. I, I think that we are finally getting a sense of humor about this out here. And the, you know, like Western Buddhism has a tendency to completely lack a sense of humor about what it's doing which is, I'll speak only for the Zen tradition that I know personally, but that's completely anathema to the way that the Dharma has been transmitted, you know, at least in my tradition for many, many, many generations. The, the stories of China where this practice took root are full of just like cursing and yelling and smacking people and like, that that's the only response in some situations to the kinds of situations that you get yourself in uh as a as while practicing the dharma and and our twitter world has a lot of names and and many of these names are self-referential names uh and, and the self-referential name that i'm thinking of in particular is the in-group which is an ironic name that people don't see as ironic because of its plain meaning. Uh, but one of the things that makes it a real in-group, no matter how ironically people might be using the name, is how laden it is with symbolism. And that symbolism is in the form of memes that have incredible uh, significance on the internet because of their meaning but because of fundamentally their sense of humor about things and so people have finally started to successfully incorporate these many semantically vast and various structures of these endlessly remixable internet memes uh they've be finally begun to incorporate like the dharma itself into these forms and it's hilariously funny to see that combination and to see how comprehensively you can teach the Dharma using nothing but shit posts and, and like, you know, memes from 4chan turned into Buddhism commentary. And so I have some reverence for the ones that are successful that I put in there. Uh, but I also think of memes as a way of, uh, giving a shout to use the sort of lynchy language like smacking someone like going from a conversation of back and forth you know verbiage to something that's much more demonstrative and funny uh that than than it was before and so you know i've collected a certain number of you know storied buddhist teachers you know, as yes memes or no memes, and I've even invented the moo meme. Uh, 
as a way, and I use these as replies sometimes. And that's really where this stupa has started to take flight is like, I will get some question from someone that's like, uh, you know, uh, does a tiger have Buddha nature was a real question that I got from someone. And like, how else can I respond to that? But to send him the Joshu meme with Mu on it that I have already collected. And, you know, uh, there, there are, there are more and more of those uh, episodes, hilarious episodes every day, the more of these that I collected. So people have started to submit them. Uh, actually, people have been submitting them all along, but people have started to create them expressly for me to put in there. Uh, and, you know, it's a who's who of people goofing around uh, on here. And I love when people make it in there for the first time. And it's become this real collaboration, as silly of a thing as it is. A lineage, you might say. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a very long lineage that I have to scroll all the way through every time I want to add to it. Uh-huh. Um, just in case there's a, a earnest Dharma seeker who is not familiar with Twitter <laughs> listening to this, can you explain what a shit post is? Yeah. Well, it's a if you're a Zen seeker, you're gonna know what I'm talking about already. <laughs> because you know, it's like a it's like a koan of nonsense that is the only proper response to a particular situation, as opposed to like an earnestly thought out, written, earn, like declarative statement of something uh, or question. A shit post is just like whatever blather is going on in your head, but there's a quality to it that I think must be learned and may be harder for some people than others. And that, and this may actually really, honestly, as silly as a, of a kind of post as this sounds, this may actually determine something about kind of the popularity of people on Twitter, because you have to be able to universalize a shit post. You have to be able to understand that the people, you have to be able to model the people. Uh, actually, I'm not sure that you have to, there's a bell curve about this, but like you, you, you like a, a, an okay, good one that most people are putting up most of the time is one that people understand out of the million stupid thoughts they've had all day is going to be one that reaches people that they spend time talking to on here. There is a God tier of shitpost that has nothing to do with anyone else in the entire universe, except the person who posted it. Uh, but those, those just, those happen by accident. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for it's that explanation. Way I'm here. It's a way of saying like, I continue to chew on reality uh you know and i want i want to put out a signal uh that that there's somebody here and i want to get signals back that you hear me but i don't have anything in particular to say <laughs> hmm. Hmm. that's an interesting interesting explanation i appreciate that thank you uh huh um yeah i'd like to ask about the next tweet which is you have this this other growing thread, which is your, uh, here, I'm going to cite this here, the meditation stuff and ta lumot, disentanglement of meditation word sutra. <laughs> what in the heck is this? That's a great question. Uh, so there's a, there's a teacher, person, practitioner, Dharma sibling uh, out there named meditation stuff at meditation stuff, aka Mark, who with whom listeners to this will be familiar uh, from recent weeks, mm -hmm. who is, as you would be, will be familiar with if you have heard him speak to Tashin, <coughs> a very systematic thinker uh, about Dharma and practice. And I mean, maybe practice, practice is probably the word to, to concentrate on, uh, you know, very methodical, it's it's a it's a it, it's a whole system really a kind of an evaluative system a system and a meta system for how to develop a lifelong practice of these kinds of things meditation etc yourself with error correcting mechanisms that take the place of you know a teacher in a lineage keeping you in a rough form uh, you know that's expected of you. Um, it's brilliant. And it's sort of like the chocolate to my peanut butter or vice versa or something, you know, it's like, 
if I were the opposite kind of person, it would be exactly what is there for me. And I guess I sort of see myself as like a compliment to what Mark is doing in such a way that it's inevitable that we were drawn together and follow each other. And, you know, I think pick out each other's most interesting posts to sort of cross pollinate. It's rare, but it's like, whenever Mark retweets me, I'm, I'm very aware of why. Uh, and, you know, vice versa, like when I when I see a, a Mark post, I need people to see, I make sure that they see it, you know, um, because our methods are so different. But it's but like our pursuit is exactly the same, you know, it's sort of how I feel. And, and because like I was saying earlier, Twitter is so just fundamentally about making statements. Oftentimes I see a Mark post and I know exactly what Mark means, but someone else has no clue what Mark means. And it's, you know, it's because, I mean, it's, you know, when I say systematic, Mark is an engineer, like the, 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 the rigor of the language is so important that it actually begins to take on the qualities of like formulas rather than sentences sometimes. And, you know, you have to be able to follow that kind of communication in order to get what he, what, what Mark is saying. And it's also very well qualified. Usually there's never any kind of bombastic statement in it without appropriate qualification, which is the opposite of how I tweet. I will just tell you like God hates this, you know, without a second thought. Uh, and so sometimes people earnestly trying to understand something from Mark are not really able to parse them. And once or twice I've stepped in and be like, then like, here's, here's what, what I think this means. And in one, in one case, actually, it was a reply to me retweeting something Mark said and saying, this is really cool. Uh, somebody asking me for clarification on why I thought it was cool. And I was like, here's what, here's what, you know, it was like a definition of emptiness or something like that. I can't remember what it was. Uh, and, and when I did that, I, I rephrased it in my own words. The person understood what I meant. And then read Mark's tweet and was like, oh, wow, I understand that a lot better now. And I couldn't help but be like, hey, Mark, look, I, 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 I translated your post. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I felt a little nervous that that would be taken as like uh, some kind of boundary crossing. But, but I, you know, had no reason to. Mark was very, not only grateful, but sort of like excited about the prospect. And, you know, we had this conversation that was, kind of to the effect of like, we should do this more often. Uh, and so we had a, like a momentary DM conversation about it. And I was like, tomorrow I'm going to start a thread where we should just do where like pick all or get people to, to, to submit like the words about meditation stuff that they want defined by us to people in a back and forth. And, you know, it's not going to be anything definitive or cosmic or universal, like, you know, it's all pedagogy, like, like we've been saying. Uh, but the two of us doing our thing is going to end up in a pretty interesting place on any one of those words. And this, this was actually kind of a uh, daunting idea to me, you know, it required some trust that we were going to know what each other was talking about when we got into the meaning of a word like samadhi, you know, and I wasn't totally sure, but I had a pretty good sense that this was going to go well. So people started throwing out words and I started adding them to this thread. And then, uh, you know, it didn't matter where the conversation would happen. The conversation would happen wherever it would happen. And I would grab sort of the top post by that person who submitted the word and stick it in there uh, into my little sutra, which, you know, we like to be cute about that word. Uh, people might not realize that sutra really means thread in like a very literal sense. Like, suture in English is the same root. So like, that's why I called it a sutra and it is a joke, but of course it's also like, this is the modern form of, uh, what a thread is. So, uh, you know, and we, I'm hanging Dharma words off of that thread one at a time. And each one contains one or more branching conversations between Mark and me and the person who posted it and maybe others kind of dancing around pointing at the moon of what the word means. And I feel really good about each one of them as resources for people who are having trouble understanding what those words mean. And I wanna keep adding to it, but it feels like we've got a lot in there already. And uh, I think it's a model of something. I don't know if it's like exactly replicable, but I think that I've always been looking for ways to collaborate with people 
on this kind of stuff that we all do such a good job of, but we have to do it ourselves because the way we tweet is esoteric and personal and threading isn't really the best to, like bilateral mode of communicating. Uh, but there has to be a way. And this is the way I found is like, you have conversations about one piece and then you can attach that conversation as one chain in a linear kind of table of contents, which is what this sutra is. And, and, and this is a model I thought of for another reason that I haven't used yet, but there's a particular book and I don't want to give it away because I don't want to commit us to doing it. Um, that a person who I also don't want to name because I don't want to commit them to doing it. Uh, and I both want to read. It's a Zen book, contemporary Zen book that I think will be really, really interesting to people because it's kind of a boundary breaking one in terms of what kinds of practices it has in it. And uh, I've been trying to come up with a way that we can post as we go together and have a conversation about the book in a public way so that people can benefit from it. Uh, but having to come up with some kind of structure. And this is, I think, a pretty good prototype. It's like, I put up a tweet that's like chapter one, whatever it's about. And then below that is the conversation about that chapter. And then we do the next one, the next one, the next one until we're done. So it was uh, both a Twitter experiment and a particular project that I wanted to do with a particular person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like understanding where this one is coming from. And now I'm looking forward to seeing in a possible future, uh, this commentary on this Zen book that you might read and talk about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, that's a pretty, uh, shall we say, friendly and enjoyable, playful interaction that you're having some, with someone who's a bit different than you, but is in the Dharma scene. And recently you've had uh, a little bit of a uh, rough and tumble interaction with another person in the Buddhist scene, uh, Vince Horn, who's been on this podcast as a friend of mine, uh, you two had a disagreement about uh, Twitter accounts and an anonymity, which, of course, your account is anonymous. His account uses his name. Can you just uh, summarize and then comment on uh, that disagreement? Yeah, well, Vince, over the course of a couple of days, took an increasingly hard line about wanting to engage with people online at all who don't use their real names and identities. And this is something that has happened on the internet over and over again for like 20 years, you know, and it happens at, at kind of remarkable level. I mean, you know, Facebook, like Mark Zuckerberg himself sort of took the, the Vince position at one point on Facebook and it caused all kinds of havoc on Facebook as far as, you know, people who wanted to use Facebook, but could, didn't want their real identities to be available to, you know, Facebook itself or, you know, whatever government agencies or any, you know, any kind of privacy concern that people might have stalkers, you know, th there were a lot of risks that were imposed on Facebook users uh, by a policy of real names. But Facebook is a place where people just kind of live their lives and they need it for transactions and for communication and for stuff like that. Like it's, it's kind of a different consideration. Twitter is in, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's a social place. Like every use that we've described today so far is a social use. It's for meeting people and hanging out with them to be sure. But it's also a discourse, a, a site of discourse. It's sort of a place where opinion and uh, ideas are hashed out. Now, I don't take it particularly seriously as a, as a place like that. And, you know, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, our corner of Twitter, uh, in which Vince dabbles by necessity as sort of a well-respected figure in the Dharma scene, uh, but it's, but it's the, the, the corner I'm talking about is not exclusive to people who are uh, even casually interested in this kind of stuff, you know, the, the, like our corner sort of exists apart from many aspects of Twitter as a serious place for serious discourse and many, and, and it's also a place where people experiment with controversial ideas in order to find community with other people who have controversial ideas 
Uh, and, and that requires a lot of people to be anonymous, uh, including myself for all kinds of reasons, which we can get into. Uh, and Vince decided to take a stance against that because of the level of trust and personal stake that he believes that you should have to put up in order to take a position on something publicly. Um, I, I feel like that's really what the, um, well, and there was also an aspect of authority. It was like, why should I trust some random person? Tell me who your teacher is. Tell me, tell me what lineage you come from and confirm for me that you're not just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually steel manning his position right now. Confirm for me that you're not just like Googling the answers to everything and, and actually have no clue what you're talking about, you know, put some skin in the game. And, and I think, and he said this, I'm not just extrapolating. I think that for him, that was an important thing to do because he did it himself. He, he put his own credibility on the line for his entire career and ended up where he ended up, which is as a person who like a public figure in the Dharma world by doing that and has taken positions, as I understand, I wasn't really aware of some of these controversies, but I learned about them over the course of this, you know, whole episode. Uh, he has taken some controversial positions and he said, this is what I believe. And if you, be if you don't believe this, then like, I'm not for you and that's okay with me, you know? And that's the kind of courageous thing that Vince is saying that you can't do if you don't have your own reputation at stake. And unfortunately, that stance resulted in Vince unfollowing me and not wanting to, you know, and like, that was all it was at first was him unfollowing me, which like, whatever, you can unfollow me whenever you want. But what he was also saying was, I don't wanna to talk to you anymore. He wasn't saying it directly to me, but he was saying it to everyone who was doing what exactly what I'm doing. And I'm doing it in a very hard line way compared to the way that some people do it. And so I, you know, was being made a representative of like a fundamentally untrustworthy underclass of people in the language that Vince was using. And I was angry about that because I feel that I have every right to participate fully in the Dharma life of the internet as this character expressly by not making any claims of authority whatsoever or talking about my lineage. I mean, I say that I'm a Soto Zen initiate, you know, like people understand that I have a householder like pro-am Buddhist practice. Uh, and I reveal through you know, things that I cite that I have done a lot of learning and things. And, you know, I tell stories from many, many years ago that sort of indicate that I, that I have been doing this a while, but, uh, you know, I don't ever say I have the authority to make this claim. I let people evaluate that for themselves. And that's what I believe everyone should do all the more. So if you're a public figure who is a teacher, like hiding behind your authority, I think to me, is uh is actually the dishonest and the the, the it's, it's not I mean I don't know that I want to say dishonest necessarily but it's the it's the stance that lacks integrity compared to just saying this is who I am and this is what I'm saying in this moment take it or leave it you know saying I have a PhD in the universe and so therefore you should listen to me like that is out of integrity to me so I objected fundamentally to the idea that having a real world identity tied to your posts makes you untrustworthy. And it, it escalated a little. I wasn't going in on him personally. I was just uh, incredulously posting to the people who I knew agreed with me because it's full of anonymous people that like this claim is being made in our community. Isn't that ridiculous? And uh, you know, it did obviously because because it's an internet fight, and this is how internet fights go. He did get dragged in at some point. People were trying to, uh, a couple of people were trying to ch interpret what he was saying charitably to mean that it doesn't apply to me, you know, because he's talking about troll like alt right trolls or something, you know, like he's talking he's talking about some specific 
boogeyman that they had come up with. And he's not talking about someone like someone like Talu Mot, who like is clearly a nice guy. And I was like, yes, he is talking about me. And, and at some point somebody was like, let's ask him. So there he was. And I was like, I'm pretty sure he's talking about me. And Vince replied like, yeah, I'm talking about you. <laughs> and I was like, that's what I thought. And that was the end of our interaction. And, and that would have been the end of the interaction, but he kept going a little bit and he posted something that's, you know, like a, an account of, you know, like, I don't, you know, it, it's do whatever you want, but I don't want to hang out with people like that. And he phrased it as like, as you know, phrased what I'm doing, phrased what having an anonymous account is hiding who you are. And I had to quote tweet him again, because I had to say, I've never shown people I've never met more about who I am than I do because of this protection that I have. Like, this is more who I am than I am in public and by a lot. And I was just indignant about that assertion. And that was what got me blocked. So, you know, that's where we stand. And I feel, I feel regret about that result, but I'm not ever going to change my position on this because there are literally hundreds of people that I have been able to meet because of this. And many of them are in the same exact position. And we are like tight as human beings and intimate with one another in this particular way. And it's only because of the protection of our privacy that we're able to be together. So that's where I stand on it. And, you know, maybe there's another place where the right thing is for Dharma teachers to be public figures that have reputations that can be tracked and that are, they're accountable for things and they can be held accountable if they do something wrong. Like that all makes sense to me. But I, there is another place where the Dharma teacher is whoever is in front of you, no matter who they are. And they can be someone else tomorrow and have the same person be behind the keyboard. And it's a new person as far as you're concerned and they're still your teacher and you're their teacher. And that's where I wanna hang out. And that's why I don't, that's why I'm a secret. Hmm. <clears throat> you sort of touched on this briefly, but uh, can you say more either for yourself or in general, general why you value having anonymity on the internet? Well, I've never done it before because like I said, I'm only one month old, mm -hmm. but, uh, I have a real need. Man, it's not even about my need. It's like, of which I do have, and I will say what it is, but that's not, that's not what it's about. I don't think that society is where I want it to be in a very particular way, as far as people being able to be themselves without consequences due to non-conformity. And what I'm really talking about is professional world stuff and maybe political stuff and definitely religious stuff. But those are stupid categories. Like, I don't think that, I don't think that any of those categories are real things. I think that those are categories that have been imposed by basically just certain incentives, economic incentives that I think are wrong incentives that carve people up in unnatural ways. And so I believe in this kind of privacy as a way of protecting oneself from having those incentives removed, you know, by getting fired or canceled or whatever, uh, while continuing to express oneself according to one's own categories in a place where 
they can't reach. And it feels like waiting to me. I didn't know this when I started, when I, when I incarnated into this being. I didn't know that there was gonna be this sort of messianic sense that someday, a very Jewish way of seeing this, someday the heavens will open and people will be free of the incentive to conform to some unnatural way of being in the world because people will realize that we trust each other and love each other unconditionally enough that we can be safe to be who we are. And when that day comes, I will rip off my tiger mask and say, here is my human face. And I believe that this day will come, but it's not here yet at all. Like I could not continue to live the life that I live if I were to identify myself. Uh, and for that reason, talking to you on here makes me a little bit nervous, but this, but I trust, you know, we've, we've trusted one another for long enough that I know that, that, that this is going to be okay. But also I want this message out there so badly that I wanted to stand up for it this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I can't speak for Vince, of course, and I'm not 100% sure that I understand his position, but I understood him to be saying like two things. One was I personally, as Vince, do not wish to interact with anonymous people. And that's because secondarily, anonymity uh, has negative consequences for discourse and society. I, I understood him to be making some point to that effect. And I can't um, sort of argue for that position for him, but uh, I could imagine him saying something like, you, um, how to put it, you choosing to be anonymous now postpones the day in which that future you're talking about arises. Because I'm not, because I don't have the privilege, I'm not, I'm not exercising my privilege to not literally starve to death for taking a stand. Something like that. I'm, yeah, I mean, I can't represent him, of course. This is an yeah, I mean, imagined I, Vince in my mind. I, there, there are privileges on both sides, right? There's the privilege. This is what a lot of people pointed out in critically responding to Vince. It's very easy for, you know, 10,000 followers, man, to uh, say, why can't you all, you know, be like me? Uh, because my, you know, someone with my whole livelihood sort of built around this, you know, like, like there's, there's a, there's, once you're there, once you're safe at the top of the hill, the, you know, like it's possible for you to say, uh, I'm safe being public with who I am. Uh, why, why can't everyone else be public? And so that's the, that's the, that's the counter argument to the one that you're representing, which I will try to represent now, which is that the privileged position is actually to pretend that your privacy is too important to advocate uh, with your real life and reputation on behalf of something. Uh, and it's like a self-interested thing to be, to do, to be like, to like, it's like an isolationist policy. It's like, I'm going to be safe in my own world and I'm not going to exercise my citizenship by standing up for the right things as a citizen. Uh, and that is something that you do in public, like politics happens in public. Like you, 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 you negotiate for the changes you want in society by being a member of the public. And you can't do that with like an anonymous avatar between you and who you really are because your interests aren't really represented at the table. Believe me, I agree with that statement in the abstract, but online discourse is not 
normal reality. There, there, it's, it's, it's not, and it's not a civic institution either. This is, this is one of the biggest delusions about social media to me. It's a left leaning delusion that like ideas are what change the world. So the place where the ideas happen is the site of democracy and requires everyone's participation. And it also requires like everyone's literacy and understanding of the facts and the science and et cetera. And your reputation in the world should depend on how uh, good of a citizen you are in the sort of idea verse, because that represents your sort of purity of intention or something like, and, and, and this is, this is an attitude that I think our entire corner of Twitter, which is another one of the names, like the one that I mentioned before, um, are that I think it exists as a reaction against that idea to say, instead, this is like all reality is virtual. <laughs> and like the, the, the thing that we're doing here is playing with the very fabric of reality. And that pervades our identities as much as it pervades anything else. And out of this will emerge ways of cooperating and collaborating and creating a future that work with zero in assumed trust and zero stake and reputation and caste and class and whatever, like ways that beings who have tigers for faces can work together. And we're working on a model. We're not working on an idea or a set of ideas or a platform or an ideology. And it is dangerous to let ideology run rampant without any accountability because that is how you get cults. It's how you get like political cults of just like ungrounded, you know, utopian ideas for how to, how to, you know, people who wear masks to impose their politics. Like I'll let it speak for itself who wears masks when they go out into the world to, to impose their politics. And it's true that some of them are anti-establishment people most of them, all of them are anti-establishment people. That's what they are afraid of. But like, you know, you wear masks to do violence in the real political ideological sphere. Maybe that's what Vince is saying, that people who wear masks are trying to uh, perpetrate violence in favor of their ideology. But what I'm saying is, this is not an ideology, what we're doing. It is a, a method. It's a, it's a practice. It is a pedagogy. It is not an ontology. What, um, I, I realize you can't speak directly to this, but maybe you could speak in general, uh, or speak around it. What, what are you, what are you, or what might one be afraid would happen mm -hmm. if you were not anonymous? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there are certain versions of that answer that I think are very popular mm -hmm. that, that make for very good memes, mm -hmm. like getting canceled, quote unquote, mm. which is like when a mob uh, destroys your Google rank, basically, you know, like, like puts up enough stuff on the internet to make you like unhirable by, uh, by, you know, uh, associating you with socially unacceptable things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then that relates in many cases to getting fired professionally, uh, which is, I think what, where it starts to take on a little more substance mm -hmm. for a lot of people is like, I would get fired from my job if people could see my tweets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is, it's, I think really hard to, say to someone in that position, okay, then get fired from your job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You should get fired from your job. You should be fired for your, from your job. Uh, and uh, people say that anyway. But, 
and, and like the counter argument again to try and be as charitable with it as i possibly can is like okay then people shouldn't be anonymous so that they can say things that would get them fired from from their jobs people should 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 represent themselves authentically and like maybe there's a good reason why those ideas are not socially acceptable um but i don't think that that attitude takes into account the real diversity of situations that people are in mm -hmm. because it isn't really just a matter of speaking of like saying the bad words being the thing that your employer wants to terminate you for like they can't deal like like an organization can't deal with the fallout they can't be distracted from their work by some stupid episode that consumes the entire internet like that's an unacceptable risk and in a lot of cases you know this the actions of just a normal person who works for a company are going to affect people with much more on the line than that person in a situation like this and that is you know like you can be as revolutionary as you want and say like powerful people who hire bad people should be deposed should be like shamed in public or whatever but like this isn't how you make those kinds of changes you don't do it in the sort of like mysterious and inexplicable surge of tweets you know that's not you do it you do it through like the real collaborative and competitive mechanisms of life so yeah it's hard it's hard to, it's hard not to like verge into particulars that begin to give the sense of what my situation is but uh let me give let me give another dimension to it it's not just your own professional life it's the professional life of the people in your life your family and friends it's your your partners and collaborators on things that might not even be professional you know think of how many like podcasts have been destroyed because one of the people got canceled what are the other people supposed to do mm -hmm. you know like the that's not like i don't have like a ton of sympathy for you know content on the internet as like a as like a, a social institution but like at the same time if you, it's art and I do have respect for that up the utmost respect. Like, I don't, you know, what I mean by that is like, I don't care if your like ad revenue goes to zero. What I care about is that the thing that you love to make can't be made anymore. And, you know, I'm comfortable saying if your ad revenue goes to zero because your co-host got canceled, maybe you should have a better business model. I'm not comfortable saying you shouldn't be able to make art because of something someone else did. So it, I guess the bottom line is this. It's very hard to imagine all of the practical details of someone else's life as a constellation of things keeping them up at night. But you can imagine your own. And think about how many little cracks in that foundation could cause the entire thing to fall apart. And you can't project yours onto them. But what you can do is assume that theirs is as insane as yours. And if you wouldn't want like a, the entire like online world yelling at you, for whatever reason, like because of the threats that it would pose to you, assume that it would be just as bad, if not worse, for the person you're talking to online. You just, it's just, it's an incredible amount of empathy that's required in order to be able to understand exactly what position someone is in. And you can't just import your own scripts for how society works and decide that that is the situation that should be replicated for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty reasonable of Vince to say, hey, I don't want to interact with 
people like these. I think a lot of the contention was around whether uh, uh, anonymous accounts should exist or not, or you know what the character of such people is uh, and what the impacts are on discourse. Um, I suspect that if we could have in, the, in this conversation, there would be a, a maybe a strong argument to be made about the negative impacts of anonymity on discourse that would be worth taking into account. Uh, for myself, I tend to value uh, the ability to be anonymous. I have anonymous accounts myself on Twitter, and so have certainly thought a lot about this, although, uh, yeah, I mean, I have different reasons that what I imagine you might have from what you've shared or or what others might have from what you've shared. So, um, yeah, anyway, it's, I think it's a, it's a pretty subtle issue and I'm interested in exploring it more both. Yeah. I mean, if only for mutual understanding, but also there might be a higher level of the discourse being possible here. So I appreciate you sharing where you're coming from on this issue. The one more thing I would say is that mm -hmm. I completely agree that it's reasonable, entirely eminently reasonable for Vince not to want to interact with anonymous accounts anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest, what I would have suggested had he been in any position to listen to me would be that he simply decide to do that and not decide to make it into a crusade that would then put everybody in my position in the position of being called un fundamentally untrustworthy mm -hmm. publicly. Uh, because it created a lot of ill will and, and I regret that. And like, I have the tendency to dunk, like I do it, I have done it. It attracts a lot of attention. It's very satisfying to the part of my, uh, you know, bundle of insecurities that wants a lot of attention, but in cases where the people who I'm dunking on didn't do something. Uh, I don't do it. I don't dunk on people for who they are. I dunk on people for what they do. And even then I probably shouldn't do it. And, you know, I have no problem with anyone not wanting to talk to anyone on the internet for any reason at all. But what I, wish is that people wouldn't normalize their own stances in such public critical what like condemnations as this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is there anything else uh related to this topic or anything else that we've talked about that you want to dive into more or talk more about or share more about yeah, I want to talk, I want to hear from you about your own experiments with identity and accounts and stuff, because I think that you've done a lot more of those experiments than I have. And I want to hear about more reasons why that's interesting, because I just have my reason, you know, and like, I have even actually tried alternative accounts that I've never, that I couldn't put more than like a week or two of energy into, uh, because I didn't inhabit the being that was manifest as that character and maybe lacked the motivation uh, that that character would have to exist. And it was really just like an idea that I had, like, what if there was this? And that, you know, I tried it and I made, wrote 27 tweets and then that was all I had. Um, but you have multiple in use uh, and, and they're for different purposes. And I just know that you have kind of thought it through and you made one reply at one point recently that was a very interesting distinction. I myself used, I locked my account for a day because of just weird feelings. Uh, in the wake of this whole episode, I was just sort of feeling weird about being people seeing my posts. Um, and I said, I'm a true alt now or something like that. And you replied with some very incisive distinctions between alts and locked accounts and you know, I can, there might even be more that I don't remember. So I just want to hear sort of you map that whole thing out and talk about why playing with it is valuable to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually pulled up earlier the tweet that I had because 
you mentioned you might want to talk about this. So um, I said, one thing I've been wanting to add to the discourse is that alts are not anonymous accounts, are not non-PFP or non-profile picture accounts, uh, are not blocked accounts. And I guess I should have said face profile picture accounts because all accounts have some kind of profile picture. But um, yeah, maybe I'll just start by teasing out what that means and then I can talk more about my own experience of it. Um, uh, some of those are pretty simple, like you locked your account for a day. So that meant that people that don't follow you can't see your tweets. It's sort of private in that way. It's limited to the people that are already following you. That's, that's like a functional feature in Twitter. And then similarly, um, you know, there's this feature of having profile pictures that can be anything you want. You can put in any picture you like, but a lot of people by default, myself included, use their face as their profile picture. Um, you in your account have a tiger. So you have a tiger face as you're joking. Um, that's, that's a distinction. So I have a profile picture, a face profile picture account. You do not. Um, yours is anonymous. Um, <clears throat> so your account is anonymous. Mine has my name on it. People can figure, you know, it's my spiritual name as opposed to my legal name, but people can figure out my legal name or just ask. Uh, I just go by my spiritual name these days in social settings. Um, so it's associated with my quote, real identity. Uh, and then that's not the same as an anonymous, anonymous account, which is uh, doesn't use just a legal name, doesn't use a given name, uh, is often has some kind of assumed name of some kind. And then alts are when someone has multiple accounts. And this is kind of what you're getting at that I've done a lot of experiment with this. Uh, so like Tasha and Fogelman, the account that typically talks about my podcast is my quote main. That's uh, a main account. And then I have a number of alt accounts, which are sort of separate. They may or may not be legibly connected to the main account where people know that it's associated with the main, but this is an increasingly common practice. And in fact, there's something called uh, the dark timeline which is an interesting name of, of, of accounts that are all alts that are all locked. And there's so that the tweets on this timeline are only visible if you have a locked account that is connected to the other locked accounts. And if you see one from someone that you're not following or not connected to, then you can't see what they say. You might be able to infer it. And this is actually, this is very in the weeds, but there's a point that I've wanted to make. I think I've made this on my main before, but I'm just going to get on my pedestal here and say this, which is if you are following a locked alt account, you should learn how to reply skillfully to tweets on said accounts because, especially if your account is not itself locked, because other people can see uh, what you're saying and that can sort of escape context in a way that the person who wrote the original tweet might not be consenting to. And so you really want to respect the privacy of a person that has a locked alt that you've been invited to follow. Uh, and the way that you will reply can be. Uh, consider of that or can kind of not take that into account and be rude. And that's something that I've learned from having a locked account myself and a locked account that is an alt myself. And sometimes people reply in a way that like discloses context and is visibly legible and searchable on the like open timeline. Um, yeah. Does that kind of get at the distinctions that you were asking about? Yeah. I mean, you clued me into that understanding about the, the dark timeline and replies in particular. Uh, and I created an account yesterday uh, for that reason. Like, I don't really intend to post anything there. I don't know what I'm gonna do, I might. But you know, really what it's there for is to reply to my friends locked alt accounts so that people who follow me on my main account don't see it. Mm -hmm. And I, I intend to be very disciplined about that. I mean, I think my preference would be for people to let me follow their alts from my main account so that I don't have to check two places. But if I want to reply to one of those posts, I'm going to switch accounts to reply. Uh, and that's why that account exists. And, you know, I'm, and I want people who know that person, or I want, I want, I want to, I want people to follow that account so that people can see the conversation who are all admitted trusted people, um, you know, within a sort of certain, you know, funny thing about the dark timeline is that, uh, everybody has their own dark timeline. Uh, there's overlap, but it's not perfect. Um, but, you know, I, and I want to be in that mix because there are people that I'm getting to know at, on that level. Um, and I haven't, haven't been, I've really just been sort of a one account guy 
and I have been replying to people's locked posts from this account for the whole time. And I realize at some point I, I did start being more careful about that, but I don't, that's not what I want to do. What I want is to say what I want to say. Uh, and so your, your, your description uh, really helped me figure that out. There's there, but there's a there's a an aspect of althood that I want to get more into because mm -hmm. like the mechanics you you were right right at the beginning you distinguish sort of like functional privacy features from you know who is this mm -hmm. uh, type of questions and you know I want to know I don't you know I'm not even that like I, you probably have accounts that I don't know about like I I want to I want to know in a in as uh, vague or specific a way as you're interested in going into. Um, sort of how you know when there's another voice that needs its own hmm. count and like what what the um like and and once they exist like how like how how does a post form for one account or the other uh and and what are the sort of strange lines and uh and and, and sensations of that and you're asking me personally yeah yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's a great question. And uh, there's a few, I, to, to really answer it properly, I want to cover a few different things. Uh, the first is very general, which has been kind of floating around in my mind from this conversation. But like, I started using social media, I don't know, depends what so it counts as social media, of course. I mean, I was using like Neopets at like six or seven. So that was probably the early days. Um, but, you know, f I started using Facebook in high school. And when I was using Facebook, um, I don't remember exactly what caused this. I think maybe it was seeing posts about like politics or something like that. But at a certain point, I realized like uh, people are using Facebook very differently than the way that I was using it. And there are many different ways to use Facebook or any social media site in general. I don't even really use Facebook these days. I have an account, but I use it for very limited purposes. And I mean, I'm on it for a total of like half an hour a year or something. Um, but like You're the welcome. same is true for any social media account and a site. And the same is certainly true for Twitter. People are using it in very different ways. And I think a lot of these problems come from people not being aware of that and assuming that other people are following the same rules that uh, you are yourself following or playing the same game that you yourself are following. And like, you and I, even though we're acquainted and know each other and like each other's accounts, um, are following different rules for how we play, right? It, it just as a simple example, like that you're anonymous and I'm not, right? Um, it's just, a, it, there's different context for that. There's different uh, behaviors and, and patterns and so on. And so um, one of the really nice things about Twitter, I think, is that it allows you to play many different games. Uh, and some of those can be done from the same account. Anyone who follows my account over a period of time will see that I'm playing a lot of different games that are sort of mutually supportive, but are very distinct, right? Like just to, to name a simple example, um, like I like to flirt with people these days on Twitter. I'll flirt with people on main. Uh, and that's different than the like, and this is a standard thing that people would do on social media, which is like market their thing. So like I have a weekly event. I have a few tweets a week marketing my event. That's a pretty standard use. And I can do both of those on my main account. I can flirt with people and I can market my events uh, or like my podcast or whatever. And those are just two of the many games that I'm playing, you could say. And those all have different rules and different, you know, contexts and aims. They're mutually supportive in my experience, but sometimes it's useful to have an entirely different account. So I have, uh, I mean, it depends how you count, but I, I'd say like six or seven active accounts right now. And they all have really different uses. So um, I'd say half of them are about, uh, you might say, um, uh, uh, kind of degrees of uh, disclosure, degrees of disclosure, uh, where like the things that I would disclose, disclose publicly to all people that might see it, you know, whether it's a government or my parents or just some random person I've never met is different than the kind of thing that I would disclose to a close friend, for example. So I have uh, my main account, which is publicly visible. That's visible to all people. It's associated with my name. 
then there's um, two alts. One is for like close friends on Twitter that it's just a little bit more private. It's a locked account. It's associated with my name, but there's like, I don't know, 120 people following that or something. If I'm good friends with someone, I'm happy to include them in that alt. Uh, that means like we've talked to each other. We have a mutual understanding. Typically, like we've done a Zoom call or something like that. It's like, yeah, I'd like to share that uh, these aspects of myself that are a little bit more private. I have another one that's much more personal. It's like very close. There's like 10 or 12 people following it. Maybe, maybe actually maybe like 20, but they're all like 90% of them are people I've met in real life. And they're all people that are sort of interested in engaging with me on a like personal level where they want to know about my personal life and like my romantic relationships or my difficult emotional feelings that day or things like that like really close friends I typically people that I've met in person um with like one exception like Jane's been on this podcast like Jane is one of my best friends I have not yet met her in person but we're extremely close so mm -hmm. I let her follow that account uh and you know and that she also like wants to know about like my sex life, for example, you know, not everybody wants to know about my sex life. That's fine. I'm, I don't need to tell everyone about my sex life, but that's what that account is for. It's nice to have people you can tell though. And that's what that account is for, right? Sorry. Say again. It's nice to, it, it's nice to have people you can tell. I mean, exactly. Exactly. Um, so there's that account. And then I have one that's just for me. That's sort of like a journal, uh, that's that I'm the only person that can follow it. And, uh, sometimes I will like retweet things from my own account and like comment on them or something like that. And I've got this whole thing going on there, but that's sort of like a private journal, kind of like how it's nice to have a journal that nobody reads, you yeah. know? Uh, and it, Twitter's functionality is kind of nice for that in some ways. I have other journals that I use for other things, but Twitter is really nice for that. And then, um, so that that's one category, right? Is like degrees or levels of disclosure. Um, there's a whole other one, which is like, more new to me. I think this is more common in our circles of Twitter, but like it's about um, like just different games entirely. So it, it, here's a simple example that will be legible to people. At least it, it's a public account that I don't mind telling people about, which is um, in the Temenos. It's in underscore the underscore Temenos, T-E-M-E-N-O-S. That's um, created by a fellow named The Wilderless that is a friend of mine. I do. And uh, he, he's been running that account for a while. It has depth psychology, union stuff. But a while ago, he had the idea to invite some other people to sort of play along and use uh, sort of archetypes to tweet on that account. So there's uh, five other people that are tweeting under that account. And we all use like emojis to indicate uh, what archetype is being tweeted under, what voice it is. And uh, some of those people are secret about who it, who it is and some of people are not, you can kind of figure out who some of the people are. So for me, I, I don't mind sharing the ones that have a lion emoji associated with them are written by me. But even in those accounts, right, they're different than the kind of thing I would post on main. They have a different voice. A lot of them like playfully allude to like lion type things. Um, and there's a whole character there that's developing that's like a different voice than the kind of voice I would carry on main. I'm like playing a character that is related to who I am. That's sort of like an aspect of myself, but I show different things there and say different things there. Uh, I quite like the things that I say there. They're a lot of fun, but they're, they're sort of a different vibe. They're a little bit aggressive. They're sort of like regal, uh, very animalistic. You know, it's a lion. It's a winged lion character. There's a beautiful picture that Sylvia drew um, that's, uh, you know, representing each of the characters. And uh, yeah, that's a really cool thing. I'm exploring a different voice that's not necessarily who I present in on my main account in public in a normal setting, but is still like an interesting aspect of myself or, you know, some kind of character that I'm like channeling or embodying or role-playing. And uh, I have another account that's quite similar to that. It's actually uh, like a femme account or an anima account in Jungian parlance. And I'm playing a woman there. I'm like playing, having uh, a feminine voice there. And uh, yeah, that's not so much uh, coming from an interest of, in exploring femininity as like, how much can I embody a character that's totally different than me? Um, and that's just kind of like an interesting experiment that I'm running. Like, can I speak for someone that's very different than I am? And so, uh, yeah, that's been a really interesting experiment to run as well. For a while, I had another alt that was 
completely anonymous that wasn't associated with my name. And um, that was kind of to say things that were just like off brand or like not things I wanted to be traced back to my main account, but they're all like things that um, I, you know, like didn't feel ashamed of or feel regret of saying it was just like, this is a different voice. It's a different setting. Um, and actually at a certain point, someone figured out who that account is. And I sort of just reincorporated that back into my main and like threaded it in a sort of way that was playful. And that was a fun experiment. I, I think, um, yeah, it's worth saying as well that like in my experience running these different accounts over time, I've learned how to talk about certain things in a way that feels like an integrity and like wholesome and beneficial. And then I slowly incorporate that into my main account. And like, mm -hmm. for example, like, um, you know, I, I said pretty casually that I didn't mind flirting on main, but until quite recently, like three or four months ago, that would have been totally like not something I felt comfortable doing. And over time, I've sort of included a willingness to be comfortable talking about romance and sexuality in a general way on my main account, uh, where it's like, hey, I can acknowledge that I'm a sexual person. Um, that's something that wasn't comfortable for me, like, months ago and now is and so over time having these different venues to explore these things allows me to sort of incorporate different aspects of myself into a more public setting and so that's that's like big picture how I think about these things and um, what my experience of it has been beautiful man it's it's like so I mean I love that I love that you're truly like downloaded made up character is someone from is is it is like a uh how to put this like an aspect of human nature more than like a particular character sketch or something you know i think that that's more like the kind of thing that i've experimented with is like there's some there's some voice in my head who must be a particular person and maybe i'll try and like let that person exist for a while and see if they're interesting and you know they're not a whole person. So it doesn't like, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that people with sort of theater or shamanic backgrounds or, you know, like there, there are certain kinds of training where you can really make that being exist, but I don't have that. And I don't know that I have really the, um, the desire to have that either. I, I, I mean, you know, as <laughs> it's kind of funny for like a, an anonymous person with a non-human face to show up and like talk about my wife and kids all the time. But like that's, that's where the real stuff comes from. So it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's part of what I am expressing, uh, to, to sort of draw from who, from my real biography. Um, but what you're, you're not, it's not that you're not doing that in that account. You're, you're, ex you're exploring a depth aspect of, uh, your nature and giving voice to it. And I think that that is, uh, such a valuable experiment. I mean, I think what one thing that really comes through in all of what you've just said about all of your accounts is that they're that you're doing these things for you, for your own reasons. And like those reasons involve other people in many, but not all instances. And, and that is because you are a being in relationship with other beings. But like, the, you need these things to be to express something that needs to come out. And, and so that's sort of an argument to, uh, to the effect of like, don't do this as some sort of performance. Like that's not, that's not an integrity. That's like, that's, that's not where, that's not where this comes from. It's for you. It's not where it comes from. And for me, I've tried and failed <laughs> to do that. And it's not where it comes from for me either. Uh, I'm just so grateful that we have this space and that the expectations of the people out there are in line enough with what this is to sort of know what's coming when somebody shows up and you know i've always been interested in that like who is this kind of moment when uh when an alt appears in my life and and sometimes they don't admit of being an alt at all so there's the question of like is this a new twitter account or is this somebody just kind of starting over again um and you, and you try and figure that out kind of based on cues like how good at twitter are they or whatever who are they following um 
And sometimes they're genuinely new people and they follow one person at a time. And I, I just met somebody like that. And I'm like blowing their mind, just introducing them to one new account at a time based on in DM. But I was the first person to follow them back. And like, I, you know, I'm just sort of dropping people in and it's like blowing their minds who's out here. Uh, and that's really fun. But a lot of the time it's like somebody I know and I just don't know it's them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so there's that question. And then there's, then there's the, the, uh, you find out about a new aspect of someone else. Like, you know who it is. You can, sometimes they admit to being an alt, whether they're locked or not. They're just like, this is an alt. And you try and figure out who that is. Uh, and, and you use kind of linguistic cues and, uh, you know, subject matter references and may, maybe whatever little details about their life they're admitting, you know, you can't help but try and figure out who it is. And then sometimes it's, sometimes it's truly like um, somebody trying to communicate with me and say like, here is another aspect of me. And I want, I want you, I want to let you in. Uh, and I always want to be in, you know, who wouldn't. Uh, but I mean, I don't know, not always, I guess, actually, now that I think about it, I have been invited in to certain alts about certain aspects of certain people's lives that I haven't wanted to see. Uh, and I'm interested, you know, I don't, um, I can't figure out what I want to say, like what kinds of alts they are. It's not like there are a few specific cases and I don't want to make anybody feel weird about it, but the, the, um, sometimes it's about content that I'm not in, that I'm not coming online for, mm -hmm. which is to say things that will give rise to certain feelings in me that I don't want to have mm -hmm. positive, negative, harmful, helpful, you know, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Like, I don't, I'm not here to see that right now, but other times it's aspects of somebody else that I don't, um, think I should know about them based on our relationship. And that has to do more with sort of like personal psychological things. A lot of times people create alts to disclose, uh, difficult emotions and situations specific situations about their life that are harder for them than they want to talk about in public. And I am there for that for some people on Twitter, but not everyone. And I kind of wrestle with it a lot actually about like how much of myself to open up to each person one at a time. Uh, and clearly a lot of this privacy stuff is bound up in this also is like, how much am I going to tell, you know, that I, I have to negotiate almost on an individual basis. Like how far am I going to go with, with people knowing who I am? And like, I have some hard rules about like, I don't, I'm not going to put it on Twitter. Like if we're it, like, even in DM, like if I'm going to tell you something or even like share my phone number with you or something like that, some other transactional thing that needs to happen, we need to do that on another channel. So here's a fake email address and we'll use that to coordinate it, you know, whatever it is. Um, and the, 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 this extends perfectly into this other side of like, the, what is my relationship with this person? And these alts represent aspects of, uh, it's not just aspects of a person. It's like aspects of a relationship that they're extending to you. Someone is extending to you or you're extending to someone else. And do you want to be in it or not? And, you know, it almost touches on, I feel like we have enough time to talk about something that's probably a really big issue uh, that you've raised recently that's connected to this, which is following, unfollowing mm -hmm. social <laughs> dynamics of that. Because like in the transition to that topic is that like somebody like you with, with multiple interfaces to be followed, you're giving people the choice of what kind of relationship they want to have with you. Mm -hmm. and I appreciate that even about the people whose alts I don't want to follow. I really appreciate those invitations being extended to me. Uh, and sometimes I take them up on it anyway, as a risk of like, do I really want to know about this side of this person? And I find out that I do, you know, um, and it changes the relationship. So, but then like, if I unfollowed that account, I'm not unfollowing their main account. I'm not saying to them, I don't want to hear from you anymore. And this is the signal that I think you've picked up on. I want to, I want to know how much you've elaborated 
on the things that you've picked up on about what people are harboring about following and unfollowing? Because I know I have my own feelings about it. I know I've been on the internet long enough to know that most of them are irrational and insane and dangerous. Uh, and, and I've also like overcome a lot of them too. Um, but one nice thing about having multiple accounts is that you give people the option to sort of partially follow and partially not follow and you break up that binary signal of like, does this person want to hear from me or not? Um, and people, when they only have one account, do really, in general, and I'm speaking for myself too, do really take seriously that binary signal of like, oh, this person doesn't want to hear from me. And uh, I've noticed that I think you have some uh, observations about those expectations, and you might might be seeing some stuff that are out of alignment with the way that this stuff should really work, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is that and tell tell me tell me what you've observed? Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I think you know when we started talking about different kinds of accounts, we talked about like a distinction between features that Twitter provides and sort of other things about the way people use it uh, that are not intrinsic to the, the feature set provided by Twitter. And I think there's a similar thing here where like following and unfollowing is a mechanism that Twitter provides for accounts, right? Um, and and it's, it's, it's a very strange mechanism if you think about it, because there's no, there's no exact analog to uh, re, you know, quote, real life, spatial, physical, embodied, social interactions. There's something similar of like, uh, I've talked about it with some people of like, whether you choose to stand near a group of people uh, at a party or something like that, but it's it's not really the same as that. There's not, there's no quite neat analog to following. Um, and uh, it's, um, and, and so before I get into this more, there's another mechanism that Twitter provides, which is lists. These are these are not as well known or not as well used and- um, Pain to manage. A pain to manage. Um, I use them pretty extensively myself and, but, uh, and, and some people never use them. Some people use them a little bit, um, but they're, they're sort of like overlapping feature set of like, you could have someone on a, on a list and not follow them for example, and I do this all of the time. This gets a little complicated with the like locked accounts thing because you have to follow someone in order to be able to see their locked account content. So uh, you can't have a locked account ac content on a list if you're not following them um, or their tweets just won't show up. But but there's some overlap there. And um, uh, yeah, in any case, um, I, I've done a lot of experimenting with this, just like I have with accounts of like who I follow, who I don't follow, who I have on lists, who I don't have on lists, what kinds of lists I have. There's a billion with different ways to do this. And um, in recent months, I've been exploring this quite a bit because there were certain kinds of things that were sort of emotionally triggering for me in a way that I wasn't wanting to interact with and um, just needed some space around certain kinds of content. And so I... Uh, you know, and, and and I should say as well, there's a tool called um, Tokimeki Unfollow, which I've used quite a bit. It's it's sort of applying the philosophy of Marie Kondo to your Twitter follows of like, does this person, does following this person spark joy for you or not? And it's a it's a really nice tool actually. Um, and I've used that before. I I as back in the day, I think I followed like 1,200 different accounts, and then I narrowed that down to about 500. And then a few months ago, or like a month ago, I recently did an experiment of like unfollowing, you know, 400 of those people. And I was just uh, following about a hundred people. Now I'm back up to about 200. Um, but all of the people that I had on, that I unfollowed, I put onto lists. So I was still connected to them. I was still aware of their tweets. It didn't mean I didn't like them or something. It's just like, hey, this is what I wanna see on my main homepage when I log into Twitter. Um, like this is the content that I most want to see other things. I might be a little bit less interested in seeing. It doesn't mean I don't like the person. It doesn't mean I don't consider them a friend. It just means like, I may not be wanting to see the content that you're putting out there on my main homepage screen. Every time I log into Twitter kind of thing. Um, and there are certain kinds of content that I really do want to be seeing pretty regularly. I want to make sure that I see them and that they don't get lost in the noise. Um, and so, uh, yeah, when I did that experiment, I noticed that 
a lot of different people unfollowed me as well. And uh, I think from that experiment, both just what happened and uh, seeing some other takes about it, it, it occurred to me that people are really equating this following mechanism, which is a, a technological mechanism on Twitter with friendship, right? Um, and they're, I'd say, related and overlapping, but not the same. And I have friends that I don't follow on Twitter that I don't uh, need to see their tweets, but I still consider them a friend. I'm in touch with them in other ways. I see them when I can or whatever like that, um, but I might not wanna be seeing their tweets at that time or following them at that time. Um, so I think they're basically for me at this point, at least in the way that I hold it, um, it's just not the same thing as friendship. I think there's a there's a sort of um, related view that's pretty popular in our corner of Twitter, which is like you should follow mutuals, people that follow each other, and like just follow people that you also follow and kind of interact with those people. And if you're primarily prioritizing socialization and friendship, um, that makes that strategy makes a lot of sense. So if someone unfollows you and decides not to be your mutual anymore than from that strategy of like, I only follow people that also follow me, um, it would make sense to unfollow them. And so that behavior that I saw of a lot of people unfollowing me makes sense. Um, and people are, of course, willing to unfollow, you know, totally able to unfollow anyone they want at any time. Um, I think I would just want to put out there that it's not the same thing as friendship. Certainly if I unfollow someone, it doesn't mean I don't like them or that I don't consider them a friend. It just means I'm not following them on Twitter anymore, right? Uh, it means, it, it might, that's all it means. It's like, I'm not following this account anymore. It doesn't need to mean more than that. If you think it does mean more than that, then you can have a conversation with someone about like, hey, I noticed you unfollowed me, like what's going on? Um, it depends on the relationship, of course, but like, um, there's any number of reasons why someone might be unfollowing someone and they're just not the same thing as friendship. I'd say um, it's related to friendship, but not the same thing. There's two aspects of it that I want to talk about. The first, I just want to say so that we don't forget it, mm. which you didn't mention at all, is the number. Mm. And I want to come, I want to get to that next, but I want to make sure we don't miss it. Mm -hmm. As far as what you were just saying about what it means uh, to people, I can't deny that it means something to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't assume this is, you know, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't assume everybody has the same kind of emotional intelligence as I have, but like, I, I don't project my own feelings about whether someone follows me or not onto them when I'm deciding whether to follow or unfollow someone. But I do understand that it means a great deal to me and therefore sort of assume that I'm somewhere in the middle and that this could actually mean a great deal more to someone else than it does to me. Mm. And I, so it makes me cautious to do either to follow or unfollow someone mm -hmm. just because of the charge that it has for me. Now, why does it have that charge for me? that gets into the really complicated stuff about why do we post things on here in the first place? The emotional side of that for me, I have admitted long since admitted to myself has to do with sort of validation. The, the, the most, I don't know that this gets to everything, but I, 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 uh, I called it validated catharsis at some point in some conversation about what it is or why I was posting some particular thing. That's what I'm seeking when I put something up. Uh, that's not the only thing. I mean, like I, I also genuinely value helping people and feel based on responses that I get that some of the stuff I do online helps people with their practice or their life or their relationship or whatever, you know, like my experience, I have a sort of elder mi middle elder role. There's a few of there's a few like mid thirties millennials who sort of feel like we're becoming dad to everyone there, not just to our children or whatever. Uh, and like, 
I love, I value that role and I value kind of playing up and hamming up that role for people in their twenties who find it hilarious and, you know, also sort of value it. Um, and that is a valuable thing. I think that helps me with my life is like, it helps me assume the role of dad <laughs> because like, that's not natural in every way, uh, for somebody, you know, with a life like I've had where like dad was the farthest thing from my mind for who I am for lots of it. Um, but really the thing that really motivates me is, um, like that's not, I got have children. <laughs> I can be validated as dad in real life, but the, the, uh, the thing that, uh, really draws me back. The thing that had me overcome the sort of desire or not the desire, the thing that had me overcome the concerns about being online, uh, the privacy concerns and decide to become an anonymous account and be there anyway, is this validated catharsis that I seek. And the more people are validating it, the more valid it feels. And that is, uh, that is, uh, there's obviously some leeway with that because like there's certain people who, if they're the only person who sees something and it matters to them, then that that's infinitely valuable to me. Um, but there's a proxy also for just like, the number of people validating something um, gives me a sense. It's a sanity check, really, ultimately, is what it is. Of course, it's more than that. It's also just some sort of like social signal of how, uh, you know, this is obscene. It sounds like it's disgusting coming out of my mouth, but it's like there's a coolness factor to being popular like there has been since we were little kids. And, it's, and, and Twitter provides certain numbers that confirm or deny that situation in a, in a more objective, let's call it intersubjective way. Uh, and the reaction on a particular post is one thing, but like the follower count is another. So, oh, the number, like I, I, I don't know what possesses me to value the particular number that I value as like a sense that I have made it as an account. Uh, but it's a number that I'm almost at. Uh, and it's a, it's the, well, it's a thousand, <laughs> you know, like four digits. Right. And like, I, let me put it this way. I'm familiar with what truly high volume social media is like, and I'm not interested in it in the least. I want there to be a certain thing going on and it's right there at that number. And I, I'm almost back to it and it's not been very long and that's extremely validating and feels like I'm hitting it. I'm doing a good job, but when somebody, and so, and so when somebody I like has followed me back so quickly, having just kind of, you know, manifested in this universe, uh, that was an extremely validating feeling one after another. Certain people are not following me and I am mostly okay with it, but I would be lying if I said I'd never thought about it. And likewise, if I were to lose somebody that I valued, I would feel bad. And why is that? Like, it's probably the case that some of the people that aren't following me back have me on lists. Like I notice them in my replies sometimes, like it's, they're not, not seeing me, but, uh, that doesn't do it for me. Cause it doesn't contribute to the number. I'm not, I'm not like really saying that, like, that's not actually true. What I'm saying is like, there is an emotion in me that feels indignant that they are not contributing to my number, despite reading my tweets. You know what I mean? And like, I, I, I don't actually care. I really don't, but I, I, I compete with some lizard brain feeling that does. And so that is loaded on the transaction of following and unfollowing for me, despite my best bodhisattva efforts. And I, cause I, and, and, and you know what, when I get to the number, I'm probably going to care less. I'm probably going to unfollow more people because I'm not going to worry about whether them unfollowing me back is going to bring my number down below the number 
bring me farther away from the number that I'm trying to get to. You know what I mean? Once I've made it, I've made it and I don't care anymore. And that is obscene, but it's part of this validation. And I, because I don't have my real name attached to this, I feel perfectly comfortable airing this out. And I bet you a lot of people hearing me are feeling it too. I don't know about you. Well, it's interesting. Um, there's a lot there. Um, I, I care about a follower account as well, although I mean, probably for lizard brain reasons as well, but also for some like considered reasons uh, that might be interesting to get into. But um, it reminds me of um, a conversation that Bees and Critter had the other day that I thought was quite interesting about, about like uh, basically a, 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 um, well, Critter was talking about that Twitter gives you access to like very high profile celebrity type people. Um, it sort of flattens your access to such people. And um, yeah, and then Visa was talking about how more things, but also how, uh, well, one, like he thinks of like better forms of social media are possible and that, you know, th it hasn't been used uh, to the extent that it could be. And also he said that like, existing social norms around this are, don't really apply and people feel uncomfortable when they violate social norms because it might mean that they're a bad person or will be perceived as a bad person but like old social norms just don't really make as much sense with this sort of thing um and actually just today i was thinking about um i was remembering how i felt about smartphones when they first appeared uh like thinking i don't remember exactly but it was something like oh, people are like rude if they're looking at their phone at all in, in like the subway or something. Um, and now it's very common for people to be using their smartphones all of the time. And um, I think there's still things developing there that are really interesting to me actually, but um, specifically related to practice, actually. I, I had this shift recently where I realized like it's um, the thing that people find rude is if you're not paying attention to them, but if you can have your expanded awareness expanded, then you can include them in your attention in a way that's different than if you're just like hold in on a phone. Um, but anyway, that's, that's in the weeds, but I think there might be a similar thing here where like old social norms for like wherever you're coming from, you know, for me, you know, uh, going to high school in Massachusetts or something or going to college in Maryland in you know the 2010s or whatever like don't really apply to the mechanisms that are relevant on social media um and there's sort of like it's a little bit uncouth to say you care about say follower count in the same way that it was like rude to uh you know look at your smartphone when it first came out but i think i wouldn't be surprised if over time that changed where it's like yeah of course you would care about your follower account because it has like a social impact of certain kind. Um, anyway, I could see that it going in a similar kind of direction where you're saying things now in this conversation that might be sort of like blunt or uh, rude or uncouth or something at this time, but like mm -hmm. things are shifting. Yeah, for you, but like that five or 10 years from now, nobody would blink an eye at. Yeah, I think that's true. I, and, and there's something you started to say, I think, about access to people. And there is a credibility aspect to the number that is very different going up than it is going down in terms of your interaction. Mm -hmm. Like I, like the unsavory part of 1000 is that it put it like, you know, the, 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 community that we're in is like mostly people in the three digits and there's some people in the two digits but they're like actively not trying or they would you know have like they, if they just followed 200 people they would end up with 100 followers you know that's just the kind of world that we are in but like there's this there's this whole bustling world of people with like 300 ish mostly mutual connections on Twitter, talking to each other all day. And I'm in there with them. And getting to a 1000 is another is, is like something that I mean, this is I'm just to be clear, I'm describing a feeling that doesn't feel wholesome to me. 
mm-hmm. like I, there, there's a big kid on the playground kind of feeling to to that number in a downward direction. And I mean downward in terms of number that I f- am motivated by despite myself. Hmm. And that's not cool. And I'm saying so. But in the other direction, I think that because of this same force, people who are, let's say, genuinely interesting... <laughs> people who are interesting enough to have that many followers that that they're on another level are assaulted by people with small numbers of followers all day long and not able to even process the information and by assaulted talk- you mean like there's lots of pings at them like yeah. replies and mention not yeah. not that they're uh, attacked or something well, sometimes sometimes <laughs> they are. yeah uh, so and you know that will make you numb to randos regardless <laughs> of what they're saying uh but you break through that for stupid reasons and end up in conversations with truly interesting people. And that's your chance, as we all know, as all of us who like are, are, are so dedicated to this platform know, like you get into a conversation with somebody that you want to talk to, you have one shot and like your shot can totally change your life, but uh, you could also just be blocked immediately. So, you know, that, and, and, and like, I don't feel altogether that that is a bad way to meet interesting people. And, and so there's a, there's like a little bit of a vote involved in deciding to follow someone because you're saying, I, I want to contribute to this person being perceived as an interesting person. Mm. And, and I honor everyone's vote that I get because it gets me that much closer to talking to uh, people who I admire and respect and think are brilliant. And what I do when I get in that situation is if somebody that I know on Twitter is going to be interesting to that person based on what we're talking about, I bring them in. You better believe that I will bring you into a conversation uh, if I think you're the expert, no matter who we're talking to. Like, I just love to do that. Hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of, it becomes a communal effort to me at a certain point about like making sure that the beautiful things going on in our community are celebrated and recognized and, and, and have a chance to succeed at deploying this model that we were talking about before of, of trust and community and learning and growing. And, you know, one might wonder why we're out there all day long saying stuff, posting. And I, I think it's because there's respect at the other end of the tunnel that leads to the kind of world where we don't have to wear masks to do this anymore. And, and we just have to get there. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, uh, like, I think that that's sort of the, I was alluding to having considered reasons why I care about follower count. And it's sort of like, um, I, I, yeah, and the way I've been thinking about it is sort of from a business strategy perspective, but of like, there's this distinction between lead and lag measures, which if someone's just watching the show for Dharma reasons, they may or may not be aware of. It's like um, like a lead measure is an early indicator and a lag measure is a late indicator. And typically you care about the late indicators, like how much profit you made per year or something, but it takes a long time to learn that number. Uh, so you can have early measures of these things that give you a signal sooner of what that is. Like, for example, at a car dealership, you might care about like, profit per month, but like a lead measure of that would be how many uh, times someone took a car out for a test drive, how many test uh, drives there were per week or something like that. Uh, That would be a lead measure that's not the same as the lag measure, how much money you made that month, but it would be something that would hint at it and you'd be able to find out sooner. And so for me, I think of a follower count as like a lead measure of my ability to uh, successfully impact the world in ways that I care about, 
Like that if I have a project that I want to share with the world that I can get it out there and like have people impacted by it or participate in it or, you know, anything like that. And so there's certain like big level, you know, multi-year, multi-decade projects that I'm embarking on and, and the follower count sort of like not the same as those things being successful, but it's like a lead measure that I have access to today about my ability to successfully bring those things about. And um, that, you know, that sort of jives with the world that you're describing of like a world where we don't need anonymity, we don't need masks and uh, different models of trust and things like that can uh, allow a society to function. And um, yeah, yeah, I just think that these things do point to at least in some ways better or at least more complex worlds and social dynamics being possible and I'm trying to bring about good worlds and so uh, put my effort into good things and so um, you know I'm not strictly trying to optimize for follower counts I'm not like doing things solely for the sake of engagement but um, what it, it's something that shows me oh yeah like people are resonating with what I'm doing I'm able to get my word out there about projects that I'm doing things that I'm up to and things like that and that I do care about. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Anything else on any of these topics that you want to mention or talk about? I don't think so, man. I think that we really thoroughly got into what I wanted to get into. And I really, it was worth the risk. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I think that it's, it kind of takes somebody in a position to uh, not reveal themselves in order to talk about the issues at hand. And I, I, you know, it's a, there's a there's a paradox here of course but it's like you know we're demonstrating it right now like like you and i have the kind of trust where we can get we can go into this higher dimensional space of conversation uh, about this kind of stuff and really 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 open it up without violating any trust and that is the example that i want to make for how uh you know, experimental forms of identity are pro-social, civic-minded, uh, you know, and, and they're just, they, you know, we, we're upstanding citizens too. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the risk and for having this conversation with me, friend. Likewise, Tashin. I'll see you out there. On the timeline. <laughs>